<laughs> Next movie is about MBS plugin. <laughs> so, so welcome to the presentation about uh, the MBS Sojo plugins. My name is Christian Schmitz, but you probably know that already. <laughs> How could you? Uh, so, so I'm making plugins since 2001. That makes it. 23, 24 years, depending on how you count it. In that time, we got 52 plugins. 49 are in the complete package, three are separate. We have 400 plugin parts internally. Some things come, some things go. There's always uh, something changing. The number is growing slower because we remove deprecated and old stuff. Uh, that Apple doesn't like anymore, or Microsoft. Mm -hmm. We have 81,000 things in the documentation. So if anyone builds an AI model, we have a lot of things to train on. <laughs> um, <coughs> this includes 3,000 classes and 2,200 example projects. So if you take off a few weeks for your vacation, you can go through them and just uh, dry them out. Mm -hmm. You may find a lot of code to just copy and paste to your own applications. And if you see any problem, please report it. Because all these examples classes exist because someone asked for it. So often a customer asks me, how can I use this class to do this thing? And I say, Oh, I will have to come back to you, and then I build an example to actually show it to them and yeah, get an example. So over the last uh, years, we had to well, keep up with what Sojo changes. So Sojo got WebKit 2 for the HTML view or Megos. So I had to actually write a complete new set of classes to support that and throw away the old classes. You know? Things come and go. Then they changed the plugin SDK every few versions. Like we got Apple Silicon support, and I saw there are new functions uh, for the array coming for the next version, so I will have to adapt. And so we adapt for new plugin SDK versions, and so you have to keep uh, getting new plugins just to keep things running. I adapted to using desktop controls. So we get 29 MBS controls for the existing desktop framework ported to the newer APA, APA2 <coughs> framework. And over 100 supporting methods also got updated to take the new classes. Frequently, um, Sojo updates the so Chromium version used for the Windows browser engine. So we have to adopt the plugin. And the current plugin can handle five different versions of Chromium, depending on well, which version you have. And of course, we add new targets like Windows for ARM or Linux for ARM. And I have to rebuild the plugin. And currently, I built every plugin library 15 times. You know, Mac, Apple Silicon, and uh, Intel. The Linux for four times, uh, three times uh, iOS or four. So device simulator, Intel, ARM. Yeah, so. Lots of work, and in the last version uh, of last year, we had the changes for the delegates. So we noticed that the delegates didn't work correctly, so Sojo fixed it, and thus broke the plugin <laughs> because it was relaying on some things being not correct. <laughs> so, well, I, I assumed this would be the correct way, but turned out it was not, so things changed. And in between all of that, there was also a new date time class introduced. So a lot of date functions in the plugin had to be updated to also take date time. So I don't want to show you everything we have. I have to cut down to one hour. And uh, so what's new since the last conference? If you like to learn more what was new in the past years, we have videos of that. So some of you may, may have heard of a little database engine called MongoDB. 
We now have a couple of customers using it. It allows you to have databases distributed over the world. So you can have different database servers in different areas. They automatically synchronize eventually. And um, so you have fallover things, uh, and you can just st store data there. And with the plugin, you can connect to one of them. This may include connecting to a cluster of them, so it picks the one which is nearest to your computer. You can pick which database to open and pick a collection, which is their name for a table. And then you can add, update, delete records, which are stored as JSON documents. You can, of course, do finds to find data and aggregate data, like uh, getting sums of, of uh, values. We can run custom commands, like ping, or to start a backup. And there's a change stream class, so you can watch all the changes happening in a table, in the whole database, or just uh, in one collection. This is great to monitor things and do an audit logging. And you can use it for all targets and platforms we support with the plugins, so everything except Android. Let me give you a little example code. So you can tell um, the Mongo change stream class that you want to watch a collection. And you can provide a pipeline, which allows you to um, narrow down the data you want to watch. And then it's just looping over it to ask if, if there's a change. And you can, of course, do that in a timer every few seconds to see if something changed. And this way, you can uh, notice if, for example, another machine has the same table open and changes the records, so you can update your list box with the records. <coughs> then next topic. We have classes for PDF specific for Windows. We have classes for Mac, Linux, for cross-platform things, but we got some classes for Windows using Microsoft's PDF engine, coming with Windows 10 and 11. It allows you to load a PDF for memory or file. You can do this asynchronously or synchronously. So you can, well, let the user wait for it to finish, or you can just show a broadcast bar that you're doing work and uh, eventually get the event that it's done. You can then query page count and sizes so you know what's in the PDF. And you can get pictures of the pages in case you like to show them or yeah, use them as a preview picture. So, and the rendering can also be asynchronously. Let me give you a little example code here. We load a, pic, a PDF from a file or from some data, a memory, memory block, or string. And then we ask for the first page. We set the rendering options to have a maximum size we like to have, a background color, and we like to encode it as PNG. And then we can just ask, give me um, the content of the page as a PNG. And then you can show it, or you can render it to a picture for showing in the social user interface. Another topic, curl. Curl is an open source library to do transfers uh, with HTTP, FTP, SFTP, to send and receive emails. We use, use it, it a lot, lot. Uh, for our plugins and our projects. And I also um, help the open source project. So MBS is a sponsor there. And I contribute code if I can. So I'm not just fixing it for myself. I give it back to the project so they can ship it. And yeah, you may see my name sometimes there on the author list. Um, then uh, I have a multi-interface uh, class, which allows you uh, to run several transfers efficiently uh, together. Like you can do 100 downloads in parallel if you want, and uh, not use 100 different threads, which you could do as a plugin, but use one thread to monitor all the transfers. Um, this allows you to run uh, transfers asynchronously. So you can just say, I set up a, a curl object with all the options I want, with the URL, and then pass it to the multi-class to uh, do the transfer, and I get an event back when the transfer finished, and then I can check whether it was successful or not. We got um, functions for WebSockets with curl, so you can connect to our server uh, using WebSockets, and we have a WebSocket class there to hold the data for 
one of the messages. Now, here's an example code for the asynchron curl. So we set up uh, the curl object on the top, then we add it to the shared instance and uh, give it um, a uh, delegate to call when the transfer finished, which allows you to put whatever method you like there. And then when the transfer finished, you can check the error code, the debug messages, and uh, ask for the data and the output data property, which I think uh, makes it very easy to do asynchronous transfers, especially you could do a uh, fire up uh, <coughs> download, and then if it comes back and tells you your login token is invalid, you can just fire another method to run the login process, and when it finishes, you can run your first process again to then down do the download. So you can just have everything run asynchronously, and uh, the user doesn't need to wait necessarily for the download to finish. Then we got people asking for viewing PDF files on Windows natively. So instead of writing your own viewer using our Dyna PDF classes or the Windows PDF classes, you can use the Win Preview Control on Windows, which uses the PDF engine included with Windows 10 or 11. So you can show the PDF, you can scroll through the pages, you can navigate there with, um, with buttons to go to the next page or last page, you can switch the view mode uh, with a zoom button, and it's built into Windows, so you don't need any additional software like Acrobat Reader to view your PDFs. And it doesn't have any controls for someone to download the PDF or so. So if you want to show a PDF without giving people access to the file, you can do that. Then we have uh, people who like to show things on iOS. So we got a quick look preview controller, which allows you to show documents on iOS. It's frequently used for um, Office files, like you have an application receiving a, a file from Microsoft Word or Excel and you want to preview it, as well as any kind of text files, uh, with rich text Word files, um, or a PDF file, so you can just show it in the, to the user and they can go through it. And you may see that in a lot of applications like iMessage or the Files app, that they just use a quick look preview controller to show you the content of a file. And it works for 3D models, if you want. Then um, we can send messages or emails on iOS um, by asking the user to, to finish it. So we have the MS um, Mail Compose View controller. It uh, shows a, a dialog for the user to edit an email. And you can provide the data for the email, like uh, recipients, uh, subject lines, attachments, text message, also HTML. And the user can then send the email using the uh, account settings of their, so um, it, it uses the mail settings from the mail application, so the user doesn't need to tell your application the SMT uh, login. Um, and they can edit the message before sending. And we have the message compose view controller to do the same for text messages, which is a great way to let the user send something as an SMS or iMessage. And you may have seen that in a lot of um, applications. If they want to share something, they may just open this and let you uh, share it on, on an iMessage. Then um, there's PDF viewers for iOS. So, you know, Soja has something built in, but you may want to have new version, uh, more features, uh, get a little bit more control about it. So you can use the Sunbell view for iOS or the PDF view for iOS. And we have the same controls available for Mac too. So you can use them on iOS and MacOS. And as you saw before, we had a control for Windows too, so you can have PDF viewers on several platforms. You can even get um, notifications about clicks. So if the user is clicking on something on the PDF, like an annotation, a link or so, you can get an event and you can actually do something about it. Like you can even let the user uh, highlight something. And, uh, 
make a, a modify the PDF. You can connect uh, the thumbnail viewer and the view control so they can uh, work together. And if you click a page on the thumbnail controller, it will load in the main controller. Then um, I got the request um, two years ago to uh, work for on the mobile ad framework from Google. So I made a plugin class for that. You can uh, use it to well make a little bit money on your iOS apps if you give it uh, to people uh, on the App Store. The plugin maps uh, the AdMob SDK from Google. Uh, to get it, you need, of course, to sign up with Google, to download the SDK, get all these um, details. So you have to add some entries to your info plist file of the application. So Google knows who you are. And Within your application, you can define where ads show. So you may dedicate a certain space on, on the screen for a banner ad, but uh, it's usually um, not much money in bad banner ads. It's often better to have full screen ads when the user um, switches between something, like switches between levels in a game. Those pay uh, more. And also there are reward ads where the user is watching an ad and gets something in your app for this. Like, please watch an ad, and then you get well, five gold coins for the game. You may have seen that in some applications. <coughs> uh, new this year is um, the UMP consent form, which allows the uh, application to <coughs> show a dialog for the user to agree to various things Google wants to do with tracking and uh, ad handling. and um, yeah, this is now mandatory, I think, for European Union at least, and may also come for other countries because uh, yeah, people don't like to be tracked. And you may have all seen that, that you go on a website to look about the car, and the next week you see everywhere ads for that car. It can be annoying. Then uh, we got classes for printing on iOS. So you may have a project where you write an iOS app and you may need to print maybe for a receipt printer or you want to be able to print uh, a contract for the user or whatever. You want to print something for the, to give to the person um, and take it home. Um, we can show a printer picker dialog so you can actually pick which printer to use nearby. You can store the URL of the printer for later and print without a dialog. Or you can just show the regular printer dialog and let the user uh, pick the printer, pick the number of pages and uh, what to print. We have several options you can set with a plugin. Like you can decide whether um, you want to pick uh, pre-pick a printer for the dialog so the printer is already selected. There's an option for duplex so you can decide whether you want to have a duplex with uh, short or long uh, edge binding. You can decide whether the print should be color or black and white, or maybe a photo printer print out. Uh, this allows you to well, customize the printing experience for users. Then uh, we saw that Apple provides a split view control for Mac applications, and we thought it would be nice to use a native one in, um, in Sojo. For years we have made uh, various split controls ourselves based on a canvas, but this is uh, the thing Apple does uh, and it has uh, a default appearance like all other applications on a Mac and you can use it with uh, containers on the left and right so it scales and you can use the lock properties so um, uh, the Controls on the left and right can grow and shrink with, with the container they are in. There's also, uh, <coughs> besides the control coming with the plugin, there's also the split view class behind it. So you have a lot of options there. You can have it vertical and horizontal. So you can decide whether to um, yeah, have it move horizontal or vertical. You can combine those. So you can, like Xcode, have several split views uh, over your user interface and the user may uh, then see where to split. And the split splitter can be very narrow, so you don't even see it. 
you can um, color the uh, the bar uh, to to move the, the split view and define what styles there are several styles available and uh, just check the documentation and this is for macOS only then um, I have a JSON plugin. Now, Soja has built in JSON. They optimize it a lot. Uh, so I had to really invest some work to get it better. So I rewrote it last year. The new plugin has a focus on performance. If I get, want to get you to use my plugin instead of the JSON item class, it must be really better. So must be faster and have some additional features like searching with uh, James Pass or with uh, query and replace. So you can do search and replace in a string. Let's say we have an example here. You have a JSON object with uh, a field people and that has an array with several records of people and you can ask the plugin to find you certain records like here age is more than 26. And then you can take the result of the records and actually build a new JSON block if you want and rename the keys like we often have to make interfacing code which takes a JSON from one place and pass it to another place they use different key names so we have to rename the keys and then you can also apply a sort operation if you want and so sort the JSON by here the name property can be very useful Then uh, the new classes do a lot with iterators. So you can loop over all the entries in an array, in an object. You can loop over the search results. So you can uh, use a lot of for each loops instead of uh, counting up. Then we have diff and patch functions. So you have an old JSON, the new JSON. You can make a difference and see exactly what changed and later you can apply this to another JSON. This can, for example, help you if you have a big JSON, you just send the diff over the, over the cable, and then on the other side you can apply the changes to your existing JSONs. Let me give you some example code uh, for our JSON class. So you can use it exactly as uh, the JSON item, if you want, you can use it like our older JSON MBS class, so a lot of things are overloaded, and you can use them either way. In this case, uh, we create two book records and then add them to an array, and once we have them in the array, we want to run the query against them. So in this case, let's just find all the books where the price is below 10 and return us a title. And this will run over the JSON, perform the search, with the filter criteria and then give us a JSON array with just the title. So. Yeah. And uh, this gives you the possibility to have your application do a little bit meta programming. Like instead of hard coding things to, to work with an API, you could uh, make this a preference, a setting, a configuration file where you can put in the query so you can update the query later without rebuilding the application. Then another topic, Bluetooth. We have classes for Mac and Windows to do Bluetooth, also for iOS. And uh, the Windows Bluetooth LE classes got updated to have new uh, class um, for pairing. So you can check the pairing status of the, uh, of the device and start pairing or do the unpairing if you want. And we got uh, Got session class so you can do several operations in a session and uh, better talk to a device. And you can use Bluetooth LA for a lot of things um, like uh, heart, heart rate measurement or blood pressure or just a scale, whatever you like. And uh, the, the good thing is that uh, Bluetooth LE is very uh, power efficient and just uh, sends little, little messages, um, broadcast little messages when something changes so the, the Mac or Windows or iOS device can just receive them and show the current value on screen. 
Then um, you may have seen that uh, if you use the HTML viewer on Windows with Sojo, you may uh, get Chromium. And Chromium is a 250 megabyte library, which gets added to your application. And also, why bring your own Chromium version when you can just use the one from Microsoft? So Microsoft ships the WebView 2 co component. You can use it with a plugin. You can um, check which version is installed. If no version is installed, you can just tell the user here, please download the installer, run it once. Or you can even in integrate the installer in your application installer yourself. And there is a smaller version of it, which is just one megabyte. And it will just uh, check if it's installed. And if not, it will download the components and install it for you. Oh, so a few highlights of, of this control. Um, it has a lot of properties and methods. But for example, it includes uh, the possibility to print. So you can print the content of the web page you see. And not just think about our web page, but the web page could be an invoice, which you create as HTML. And then you use the print settings and tell it to print to a PDF file. So you can convert from HTML to PDF using our WebView 2 control. The same is possible on Mac with uh, WebKit cl classes. We can handle cookies. There is a cookie manager class and a cookie class. So you can have the user do a login to a web service and then grab the cookie to use it with curl requests with other web views. So you just need the web view for doing the login. Then we have classes to run JavaScript without a web viewer. So without a browser, you can just run JavaScript to do some calculations, like um, running some script to calculate a hash for some login token, or you can use JSON operations in JavaScript. And we have two engines there. We have JavaScript uh, with the duct tape engine and JavaScript with WebKit. So you can run JavaScript without a HTML viewer using the WebKit engine from Apple. And you can get the WebKit engine for Linux, Windows, MacOS, and iOS. So for Mac and iOS, it's built in. For Linux, it's a package you can install. And for Windows, it's a collection of a few DLLs you can get. And uh, the easiest way is to just have iTunes installed and just tell the plugin to load the DLLs from the iTunes folder. So you have to load the library manually and uh, on, on, on Linux and Windows. MacOS iOS is automatically because it's coming with the system. And let me give you a little bit of code. So you create a JavaScript context, which holds the context information, like global variables. And you save uh, the, the functions you defined yourself. And then you can just call evaluate script and pass it whatever JavaScript you like. And then you get back a JSON value. And if it's not null, you can, of course, ask for the string value or number value, and then show it and use it. So if you have some JavaScript code, or you can use JavaScript to let the user script your app. Like you can use JavaScript as a scripting language for your own application. Then we have DynaPDF. DynaPDF is a huge library for C++ developers, which I webbed for Sojo, so you can use it. It can do a lot of things. It can uh, create PDFs from scratch, uh, import PDF, edit PDF, encrypt them, decrypt them, sign them, um, fill, fill in forms, um, render pages. And we got a new parser interface class. So you can use the parser, which is used for years internally, to actually do some special things for you, like extracting text and doing search and replace of text in a PDF. Uh, we used to have a class for this, but the new parser does it better in a lot of ways. It can even um, find and replace text that is um, not, not horizontal, but maybe on a curve. And that's something we couldn't do before. You can uh, get the coordinates for the text it finds. 
so you know exactly <coughs> where it is on a page and you can highlight it to the user. If you replace text, you can set an alternative font, like if the font uh, used in the PDF is not available on your machine and not enough letters are available in the, in the document. Because we use font subsetting, we only include the parts of the font that are actually used. But if your replacement text doesn't have those, uh, does have different characters, you always need a replacement font. You can delete text in a rect angel. That's something law lawyers like. Like you have a document and you want to give it someone, but you don't want them to read all the text, so you can black out some text. And it really physically removes it from the PDF. It's not just black bars that you can remove. And we got support for PDF A4 and PDF UA1. And all these different PDF uh, versions we support. So PDF A in 1, 2, 3, PDF X in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I don't know, so many. And now PDF with universal access. That's something the client may ask you about. Can you please make your PDF and the standard? We need all invoices as PDF A. We need all PDFs we send as PDF UA format. You can do that with a plugin. So let me give you a little bit example code. So you have the, the parser object there. You can set some options like case insensitive may be good. Then you can uh, enable text selection so it actually remembers where the text is. And then you can parse a page, run the loop to find text based on uh, some text pattern you look for. And then when you find some text, you can replace it and then continue your search. This basically does search and replace. We have used it uh, for clients um, where basically the actual user of the application makes the PDF as a template, has some, you know, this dollar, dollar, date, dollar, dollar text, and we just search and replace it so the user can modify their PDF as a baseline, and we know exactly where we put our, our actual values. Then, uh, looking on macOS, we found that Apple has a segmented control and a pass control. And, well, there was a, a use for that. So I made uh, a control for Sojo to wrap the control. So we got the segmented control control because it's based on the segmented control class. And we got the NS pass control control. And you see the pattern because it's based on the NS pass control. So, the names may be funny, but the classes can be useful if you need to display a pass to the user like the finder does, or you like to have a little bit more control on a segmented control um, than the one provided with Sojo. You can also ask our plugin to give you the NS segment control object for the control from Sojo, so you can modify it with a few of the properties we have. And this is, of course, only for macOS. Then uh, another thing we have is touch events. So you know all your Macs, uh, your MacBooks have uh, big touch pads, and you can actually uh, get more of them out of them than just mouse clicks. So you can re receive touch events on macOS, not just on iOS. Uh, and so our NS event class got updated with new methods, and we got a new NS touch class. And this class now has uh, properties like a normalized position and the device size. So you can actually know how big the touchpad is and where the user is on the touchpad, which allows you to do nice things like drawing uh, on the touchpad. And to catch Gestures, we have the canvas gesture class, which connects to an existing canvas control and then provides uh, the gestures events for, for this canvas. So, yeah, you can get gestures like swiping, rotating, what was that one? zooming, or in your Sojo app. And it works with the older canvas control and the desktop canvas control. And then 
we have a SQL plugin. Because something like 15 years ago, we decided, oh, we need a little bit more. And we got connections to 15 different databases, database systems. So if you have a need to connect to a Microsoft SQL Server from your Mac or Linux box, why not? If you like to connect uh, to kubesql with our plugin instead of the official one, or you have a customer with an old DB2 database or Firebird database, you can connect to it, read and write some data. Our plugin provides a few more options, like we can do blob streaming. So instead of just getting a blob as one big memory block or string, you can actually have it streamed to disk or to an event where you get it in, in chunks or you upload in chunks for your blob. Um, and we have multi-threading support, so you can run a query threaded, so it doesn't block your user interface. And we do bulk transfers. So if you query thousands of records, instead of getting one record at a time, you can tell the plugin to download them in batches of 100, which reduces the network latency. We got a rows affected property to tell you how many rows are changed by the last request. Like if you update a few records or if you insert one or you delete a few, you want to know how many did I hit. And we got unit tests. So I actually wrote a, a test project which does hundreds of things with the SQL uh, interface from the plugin and actually verifies uh, the result. So if I would break anything, I can now check for it. I added support for the end of file, or I think it's now named after last record or so, uh, and move first, so we can use it with row sets and, uh, well, use it in for each loops. If you like to use SQLite, we got custom SQLite functions in Sojo. So you can use Sojo code and tell the plugin to call a certain uh, delegate here with address of to call it when, whenever you uh, use the function in your SQL statements. So you can provide your own functions to SQLite engine and this works both if you use the MBS plugin for the SQL as well as the SQLite database class from Sojo. And uh, our internal SQLite library provides you not just uh, support for the functions here, but also for the Unicode support. So the plugin has uh, full Unicode support and you can actually do searches like in German with, with umlauts and you actually find the thing you expect. Then uh, we implemented the scintilla control. This is an advanced text editor for desktop projects. Like if you want to use our plugin to make, for example, JavaScript, the scripting language for your application, you may want to have an editor window. Or for Sojo script, you may want to have a window to show Sojo script code and actually get syntax highlighting for it. And we have syntax highlighting for over 100 different programming languages, including one for Sojo. We have code folding, so you can collapse sections uh, there's auto-completion and call tips. So you can provide a list of keywords and it can auto-complete, as well as provide some, uh, the possibility to show little call tips, like little, um, so you type, you, you're clicking with a mouse on something and you see the parameters of the function. It has error indication, so you can highlight syntax errors if you want, and provide custom syntax styling. And there's a possibility to find and replace, so you can offer the user a find panel. And this can include regular expressions. The control is available on Mac, Windows, and Linux. And uh, we got it improved over time, so you find uh, newer versions, for example, have more for context menus. So you can use the standard context menu or your own, whatever you prefer. Let me give you an example for custom styling. So if you don't want to use the built-in style 
engines, you can make your own. And in this case, we made one which just uh, applies a different styles to digits. So you can have soldier code to style a line of uh, code. And then it gets code whenever uh, the user changes code and it needs new style information. We also got a function to format a range of text. Uh, this can be used uh, for print preview. So you can use uh, printing with a graphics object pointing to a picture to get a, a preview. Or you can use the graphics object from a, a printer to actually print on text pages. This way you can print source code over several pages and uh, yeah, make a, a nice soldier clone if you want. Now people use it for, as I said, scripting language within their application, which can be soldier script. So then, chart director. Chart director is a powerful uh, C library for making charts. And we wrapped that a few years ago for use in Soldier. It <coughs> provides 29 different types of shards for Unicode support, allows you to generate HTML maps so you can actually show the shard on a website and uh, accept clicks on it, as well as making shards as PDF graphics for embedding in your PDF documents or just as picture. Uh, and you can do SVG output. So new and uh, the latest update was uh, tree map shards and heat map shards. So you can show um, my tree. It's just a new chart type and uh, multi-page PDF output. So you can have several charts go into a PDF document without using Dyna PDF. But usually we combine it. So we make PDF shards with a chart director and then place them as uh, like pictures in Dyna PDF. There's support for high DPI, so you can tell the engine how many DPI you need for a bitmap picture, like tell it to use uh, here 2x for screen, or maybe 300 DPI for, for printout. There are functions to do surface projection and textures. You see it here on this uh, example one, where we have a picture on the bottom, which is then projected on <coughs> the 3D graphics. And this can be output as PDF and SVG, if, if needed. Then uh, back to Windows. Some people like to know the state of the power supply on Windows. And especially, we got new events there to tell you if the battery changed. So you can monitor how much battery is available, whether the lid changed. So the lid switch is when you close the laptop. So your application can know about that, as well as if the power source changed, like the user connected, uh, well, power. Or the uh, device gets suspended, so it's uh, basically uh, going to sleep, as well as uh, waking up. And another nice thing we, we found on the way is uh, that we can have the thread execution state and tell Windows that it should prevent a display or a system sleep. We have similar functionality for Mac, too. So if you have something which needs to run, like um, a kiosk application, uh, something that presents um, a video, you may want um, to disable system sleep uh, yeah, so it doesn't stop. Then I finally came to make my own XML plugin. You know, Soldier has XML classes built in. <coughs> We always thought, well, they are good enough. Uh, we just use them. But then I saw, oh, well, we could do better. So I got an alternative for you. It has a similar interface. So you can usually just switch over easily. But it does better Unicode support and has quite a good performance. And it has some modern touches, like iteration. So you can do for each loops. Especially if you have a big XML, let's say your XML has uh, some records with sub-records, you can make a loop to tell uh, the plugin, let me make a for each loop over the sub-records. So it can look in the XML tree for certain um, tag names and find all the, all the objects and let you iterate over it. There's also the possibility to iterate over a tree. 
And we have an evaluate function for XPath queries, which gives you, well, a result object to point to the uh, notes you found. The parser can be configured uh, to do validation and other things. And it's available for all targets and platforms, so Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS. And another interesting thing we made is crash prevention. So sometimes we have functions that sometimes crash. <laughs> well, shouldn't happen, yeah. But we got a, a model for that. So we can catch some things like invalid pointer access, invalid instruction. So the very things your application may get terminated for if you do that. So floating point exceptions, uh, wrong system call, broken pipes, or bus errors. So if you have a memory address that's invalid, uh, we can catch that. We also print a stack trace to a standard error on Mac and Linux. Uh, just in case you're debugging it and you're running the application from the terminal, you would see the stack trace and see where it happens before we continue your code. So if you have some external library that maybe has a bug um, and crashes sometimes, you can still use it. And here's some sample code where we just make a try catch and we call a function which may crash and then uh, if, if the plugin catches a crash, it will report it as a normal exception. So, first, well, one of the things that shouldn't be needed until they, they are needed. <laughs> yeah. So, then libxl. libxl is a nice library to read and write Excel files without having Microsoft Excel and without paying for Microsoft Excel. So, we have been doing that for over 10 years. Um, I usually uh, email a lot with the developer so we can get things fixed and uh, support you with all your needs. And uh, you can read and write Excel documents in the older format or the newer format. You can even um, work with template files. And recently we added conditional formatting for Sojo. So now instead of just relying on, on something in a template document, you can now create conditional formatting on the fly in your code. Which can be useful, so you can automatically highlight certain um, things based on the value, for example. <coughs> we used to just uh, open an existing Excel document as a template and fill in our numbers, but now we can actually make new rows and then apply the same coloring you can also work with form controls in Excel files. So an Excel file may have a button, may have a pop-up menu, list boxes, and you can uh, read uh, details about them and change them in, in code. There are new properties for tab colors, active cells, code selection, so you can tell, um, you can set which, um, which tab, uh, no, uh, which sheet is active when you open the file and where the current selection is. So the user uh, lands right on the spot where you want them to, to be when, this, when, when the document opens. Um, all this requires a LibXL license, which you can also get on our website. It's per platform and per developer. So uh, you may have to check uh, which platforms you need. So actually some people just deploy to Linux for web app and uh, don't buy the Mac or Windows license for debugging because, well, it's just a banner, but we appreciate if you do. So then we have some hidden improvements, things I changed and you don't notice. And the longer I make the plugin, the more I have to do maintenance on the plugin to keep them running, updating open source libraries and stuff like this. And one thing I did is I used fortified source checks for, uh, Win for Linux. So Linux has older APIs and over time got newer APIs and the newer ones do more checks. So you can call a string function in, in C code and uh, the older version just take maybe input and output pointers and does the work and may override some buffer and you don't know it. And the newer version then um, 
requires you to tell actually tell how big is the input buffer maximum, output buffer maximum, so it avoids any buffer overflow. And to switch from the older functions to the newer functions is, um, doesn't change the functionality. It's just that it prevents the possibility of this function crashing by overwriting memory. And switching those library functions uh, is some work, and uh, I went through all the plugins to yeah, fix all the compile errors until it worked again. Then um, we had uh, from some time the dependency on newer Visual Studio libraries because I updated Visual Studio, but then I went back and um, lowered the requirement to the older libraries because um, Visual Studio 2015 is the version Soju needs. So you don't need to <coughs> install additional things. And uh, this may help you in case you may have seen a user who complained that some library isn't there and he can't run the application. Same thing happened on Linux where we accidentally got the dependency on a newer glibc version that doesn't exist on Soju Cloud. So because the Linux distribution used on Soju Cloud doesn't have it, uh, I needed to remove this dependency so plugins from 23.5 on can uh, once again be used on Soju Cloud. And there was a big update on OpenSSL. So OpenSSL is a library used for encryption for SSL and uh, we have been using the older 1.1 version uh, until I finally uh, started the work to upgrade the newer version, the newer branch. And uh, we got a quite a few improvements from that, newer ciphers, but immediately it broke some people's code, you know, because they relied on older uh, encryption. And so we had to figure out the switch to bring back the older encryption for them if they want. So older encryption is opt-in because you should have secure applications and these newer ciphers have been around for 10 years and you really have to find an older server which hasn't been updated. Then a few smaller improvements. A lot of work for me and now Graphics Magic can read WebP documents. So if you use WebP images somewhere, you can read them with Graphics Magic and convert them to PNG or the other way around, which may help you if you have a um, content management system for your website and you need images in the WebP format. Then we have the photo picker view. Uh, used to be, I think, only for Macos, and then I worked to get it working on iOS too. Just like I spend a day of work and then I can make a check mark in the documentation. That's all. No, also on iOS. The archive classes uh, to read and write uh, zip files and other compressed files uh, got updated to no support at set four and set standard uh, compression. Just in case one of your clients has a zip file or an archive file, uh, one of the different formats, with that standard, uh, we can unpack them. Then um, the roadmap basically is what you wish for. You know. So the things in the plugin exist because some customer contact me and say, I need that. And especially if I see two, three customers asking for the same thing, it may be worth to do that. So one of the things I may do later this year is to look into all this HTTP2, HTTP3, quick thing. So there are a few newer HTTP standards. Um, we could use them in the plugin. Um, a lot of services nowadays uh, still provide HTTP1, which is good because that's what we have. But uh, eventually uh, we see newer services to not support HTTP1 because they just started today and those standards have been out there for a few years. And one of them is um, Apple's interface for sending push notifications. The newer one is HTTP2 only. Um, so if you would want to do that directly now from uh, Sojo, we would need an, a class for HTTP2. Then uh, I'm looking into platform specific classes. You may have seen that we have PDF classes now for Windows. That's because I'm uh, looking uh, into the 
documentation from Microsoft on what classes they ship with Windows 10 and 11 to see what we could use in Sojo. As well as I'm always watching what Apple does uh, on new classes and I'm also looking on Linux to find new things you could need. But if you have an idea, please tell me. Then maybe I do something for Android. We'll see. Especially I would like to know uh, later this year when Sojo Library maybe comes, um, how I can embed uh, C++ libraries. That may be actually a lot of work for me because with Android running on several CPU architectures with different versions, we will see how many different variants of library I have to build. Um, like the Sojo library may be huge. It may contain maybe 10 different versions of a library. And then Sojo has to pick which one to include in your, in your application. Uh, then Apple has some newer classes which are based on Swift code. There is a way to uh, integrate Swift code into the plugin. I have uh, made a few tests for that already. So I'm looking into what could be interesting enough that I would uh, make it available for you guys. Uh, we have to see. A lot of um, Swift stuff is of course available in other ways, so uh, not so interesting, but more and more newer operation system will ship with Swift only frameworks from Apple, and then maybe I have to finally do it for a feature. Otherwise, please send me your wishes. Um, I collect them on a big to-do list. It's really getting huge. <laughs> but uh, so I can pick things uh, based on what, what several people need. Or as, as usual, also um, sometimes a company says, I need this feature next week, how much is it? You know, that's how some of the classes got there. Like, uh, that's how we, for example, got started with Dyna PDF. That was a customer project. Someone said, I need this PDF classes, I need to do the things. And uh, I just made them uh, the class with, what the, with the features they needed. And then uh, just as when I saw this could be good for everyone, I started adding more and more, and now we cover the wall library. So now it's time for questions, if you have some. So the question is if we have an example for controlling a calibration device with Bluetooth. Uh, the answer is no. Okay. Usually uh, we have a lot of customers with different devices. The question is always how to connect to. Uh, we have a serial port class, we have sockets, uh, we have Bluetooth classes. You have to actually look up uh, what connectivity the device offers. Then uh, you have to look what uh, the protocol is. So they may tell you exactly what data package to send to the device to get it back. Like we have a lot of customers with scales to get the weight for something. And some of them are serial port. You send a command, a text command with three specific letters. You get the weight back to you. Some are serial port over USB. Some are uses USB directly. We have USB classes. Some have Bluetooth, so you need to connect to the device and send a specific sequence of bytes as a package. And then you get another sequence back with a weight. It's different for a lot of devices. So the best would probably nowadays be to have a Bluetooth LE enabled scale or measurement device that just pushes uh, via podcast the result whenever it has something, and then the Mac or Windows machine could, could receive that signal. That's something you have to ask Jeff later, maybe. Yeah, okay. uh, I remember that uh, scripting your app is okay. Yeah, okay. Just, uh, well, don't make a competitor for Sojo in Sojo, <laughs> please. <laughs> Here is uh, the current list of Lexa names. So you can ask the plugin which Lexa names are included. And I put the current output here. So the question was Lua, and Lua is here. Yeah. Do we have more questions?
Well, that's the control. And um, here is. Oh! <laughs> so, um, and as I said, you can make your custom styles by filling in the style needed uh, event. Any other questions about the plugins? Is there anyone who is not using my plugins? <laughs> okay. Uh, what library is it? Uh, so the question is about the XML plugin. Um, uh, which one was it? Xeris? This is, I hope I just wrote it here somewhere. Uh, here, oh, so says library. Yeah. It has some neat features, and uh, I may add more functionality if you need to, because this library is huge, and it has more to offer than what I just wrapped already. But. Oh yeah. So any, any more questions? Um, thank you for coming. And if you have questions, come to me. I'm here all, all the week. I can't go. <laughs> <laughs>